Welcome to Radio Free Sunroot. You're listening to the interview podcast, Voices for Nature and Peace, where we discuss issues of ecology, empire, justice, and consciousness. We feature a variety of guests who are aware of the challenges of our time and who are working to address them. Here's your host, Calibri Ter Sonnenblum. Episode 21, The Corruption of the Democratic Party, featuring Ted Rawl. Ted Rawl is a graphic novelist, a syndicated columnist, and the author of many books of art and prose, including biographies of Edward Snowden, Bernie Sanders, and Pope Francis. You've probably seen his political cartoons, which are often published in urban weeklies. His newest book is called Political Suicide, The Fight for the Soul of the Democratic Party, which uses the graphic novel form to trace the history of the Democratic Party's rightward movement over the last few decades and how its leadership has worked to suppress the party's progressive wing. Ted and I conversed on June 27, 2020. We talked about how Biden is the toughest case in years as a lesser evil candidate, how COVID could affect voter turnout, the history of Democrats presenting themselves as something they're not, how Jimmy Carter was not a saint, Jesse Jackson's 1988 presidential run, the lack of Democratic calls for defense cuts since Bill Clinton, the lack of Democratic proposals for anti-poverty programs since LBJ, how not only the Democratic Party but the nation as a whole is just coasting on undeserved reputation at this point, the question of where a progressive or leftist can go in the electoral arena, how the corporate duopoly throttles third parties, ranked choice voting, how this year's protests are really something different, and a quick preview of Greg Palast's upcoming book for which Ted created a 48-page comic insert. There's often been a discussion about the Democrats. Oh, how come they don't win as much as they should? Or how come people like Trump are able to win? And it often comes down to this sort of argument between, oh, is it incompetence or is it corruption? And your book seems to come down, at least to me, pretty solidly on the side of corruption. It is. Yeah. No, I think I mean, I think. The question is, is it a plan or is it is it a conspiracy or is it just sort of a system? And I think it's more a system that turns out to ha- end up sort of creating systemic corruption. And um, and I think that's 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 my that's my that's my conclusion. I mean, obviously, it's impossible to know uh, without being like a fly on the wall in the room where it happened. But I, since we're not. Um, you kind of have to draw the conclusion that these are people who know what they're doing, and they, um, but they don't really kind of know why. They, um, you know, they think they, I think they sort of have like there are sort of articles of religious faith within the DNC, and like for example, the whole centrist triangulation thing, and like you know, if you go too far to the left, you just can't win. But there's kind of no real de- data to support that. I mean, that may be true. But if that's but, you know, it's kind of like prove it. And and they haven't really been winning much with their current approach. I mean, this is not a party that that that, that sweeps a lot of elections. And I think, you know, I, th- what is undeniable is that this is a party who is, you know, they, there are more registered Democrats than registered Republicans. So by definition, if everybody votes in roughly equal numbers, Democrats should win most of the time. But they don't. So obviously what's happening is that Democrats are under are less motivated to vote than Republicans. And so the question is, why is that? And, you you know, it's like, well, are are are, le- are people who are left of center intrinsically more apathetic or lazier or less likely to vote when it's drizzling on a cold day in November? Or are they just simply less excited about their candidates and feel that less is at stake? And we can argue about what that is. Obviously, you know where I come down on this point. I think that they're just less, they're less excited. The, the candidates, um, you know, you know that, for example, if Joe Biden is elected, you're not going to be an exciting new policy agenda that's really going to thrill us. Whereas, like, if, say, 
Bernie Sanders or even Elizabeth Warren had been elected, you'd know that there'd be a possibility that these if some exciting policies would be uh, at least proposed and fought for, if not necessarily enacted. Right. It seems with to me anyway that with Biden, they've made <clears> – <throat> This is the toughest case they've made for themselves in years that they're the lesser of the two evils. Uh, yeah, no doubt. I mean, what's funny about this is that Biden is asking essentially for a blank check, right? Because, look, there's no I think it's not very likely that he'll even be alive in four years. So we are being asked to elect. Basically, uh, we don't even know who the, the president really will be. Because it'll be the vice president, but we don't even know who the vice pre his vice presidential pick is. Yet we're being asked to support this future unknown president. Uh, and also the country effectively will be run by the cabinet and a shadow cabinet of like DNC power brokers. And we don't know who any of those people are either. So literally, it's just like vote for these un this unknown cabal. <laughs> And against and, and all we can tell you is that they're not Donald Trump. We will also tell you that on all the key issues that progressives currently care about, whether it's defunding the police, um, Biden says he's against that. What, what, you know, the Green New Deal, Biden says he's against that, too, can't afford it. Or Medicare for all, Biden says he's against that, too. Um, and or uh, even I don't know. I'd have to double check this. I, to my knowledge, Biden has either not endorsed the $15 minimum wage or has done so unenthusiastically. And so on, and, oh, and student loan forgiveness, Biden has been downright Scrooge-like on that point, which is, and especially weird. It's like, it's like the COVID-19 pandemic hasn't changed his thinking on anything. You know, you would think that with the economy in the toilet, he might say, well, it's kind of a, but much to ask, you know, a country with effectively... 25% unemployment to pay back their student loans. Or maybe it's a lot to ask people in the age of COVID to go work for less than $15 an hour. Or maybe, uh, you know, Medicare for all is like not even as much as we need because people are literally not going to the doctor because they feel like they can't afford it. And the pandemic shows the insanity of that. So, but it, he hasn't changed any of it. So yeah, the, this is a, this is a, a tough call. And the thing that's, you know, I'm work, I'm going to work on a column on this for next week, but it's a, you know, I was thinking about framing the, the sales pitch for each candidate is sort of like, you know, we all know it like Hillary Clinton's sales pitch was, um, I have an awesome resume. I'm really experienced. Therefore I'm very qualified. Right. Um, Donald Trump's sales pitch was America has become a shithole country. Uh, our infrastructure is falling apart. Our, the streets of our Midwestern rust belt cities are, are crumbling. I will make this country the way it looked in the 1950s during the post-war expansion. And also, incidentally, white males will be back in charge. Also, it'll look like the 1950s again. We understand the sales pitch, make America great again. But with Biden, the sales pitch is a return to normalcy, quote unquote, Obama era normalcy. And the problem with that is twofold. One, Obama wasn't that great. <laughs> and things weren't that great under Obama. But I think the bigger problem with the sales pitch is this isn't really normalcy. It's not normalcy to have a president who's clearly mentally decompensating before our very eyes. We've had, you know, the last two years of Woodrow Wilson, the last two years of Eisenhower, the last two years of Ronald Reagan were all presidents who were mentally um, in, impaired in some way. But the, the thing is, they weren't elected that way. Here, we're being asked literally to vote for a guy who tells us, I'm not that sharp. That's why I'm only going to be a one-term president. And I'm going to have, and then there's this implication, I'm going to have a lot of awesome people running the show behind the scenes. You know, I'm going to have my own team of best and brightest, which, by the way, parenthetically, there's no evidence to support that since he won't tell us who they are. And I assume there'll just be a bunch of Obama-era hacks because those are the people he knows, and they weren't that great either. So... It's it it sort of doesn't make a lot of, you know, the, the sales pitch doesn't really work because we've never been asked to vote for a, you know, basically a president who's already mentally impaired out of the gate and that everything's going to be run by 
by a shadow government that we don't even know. That's never been something the American people have been asked to sign up for. Sign up for, and uh, so it's not really normalcy. It's something else. Yeah, and it seems as though we've been served him simply because they were desperate to find anyone to put in there except for Bernie. Well, they weren't. That part is interesting, right? Because it's like, okay, so let's stipulate that you and I were like, okay, we're in running the DNC and we hate, we don't want Bernie or even Elizabeth Warren. We just don't want a progressive at all. So what do we do? And the thing is, who do we get? And I think if we look back at the list of like neoliberals that they had um, in the field of 20, I mean, there's some, I think any of them would have been better. I mean, you know, I, I think Cory Booker would have been a strong, a much stronger candidate. Uh, Pete Buttigieg, um, Klobuchar even, um, certainly Kamala Harris. I mean, uh, I would vote for Mary. I mean, even Marianne Williamson would work better. I mean, in the age of COVID, you know, all that new age, um, you know, malarkey <laughs> is, uh, you know, the spiritual, we could probably use a little spirituality. Um, but like Biden literally was absolute when he, like when he first announced that he was running, I was like, this guy's going to like poll one did one percentage point. I mean, they're kidding. I think he literally was the worst of the neoliberals. So when they say, when you say like, yeah, they were definitely desperate to get rid. Of, you're right. They were desperate to get rid of Bernie. But like, I can't imagine why they thought Biden was the one to go with as opposed to one of the others. Yeah, it's been very mysterious to me. I mean, you hear them put forward different reasons like, oh, he'll appeal to black voters because he was with Obama and this and that. But it, it's it's strange. And I think that they're going to have a really hard time inspiring people to even show up with this one, even with the, the specter of Trump over all of it. I agree. I mean, I and I think that the, what people are forgetting, I mean, this is, look, this is all about turnout, right? And in a way, Trump's ace in the hole is the fact that he's convinced his, his people that the virus isn't a real threat. So therefore, if they believe that, and they seem to, because you know that's how they're acting all over the world, all over the, the red states, they're going to go vote. But meanwhile, all the liberals who, are, who would vote Democratic, they're afraid of the virus. There's no mail-in battle, ballots, right? Unless you specifically request one. You can, but most people won't. So on election day, you're going to be asked during the possibly during the middle of the dreaded second wave to go out and stand in the rain. I don't know why I'm so convinced it's going to rain, but I feel like it's going to rain on election day everywhere uh -huh. in all 50 states and, and in Guam and in Puerto Rico. And like the thing is, it's like they're, they're going to go stand in like, you know, in the in the they're going to go stand outside socially distanced, which will make those lines the longest they've ever been anywhere uh, at any time. And, um, you know, and to vote for a guy that people kind of don't really care about, that they just want to get rid of Trump. I mean, Trump hatred is a very powerful force. But it, this if if it prevails this time, it will be the first time in presidential history that anyone has defeated an unseated, a sitting incumbent without a strong policy agenda of their own and without a, a, a charismatic uh candidate you know like herbert hoover was uh, was thrown out by fdr we can see why you know reagan over uh, thrown out by jimmy carter i mean sorry uh, reagan defeated carter in 1980 again we can see why clinton 1992 we can see why um i don't see the biden thing it's like biden is not a charismatic figure and he doesn't have a policy agenda Right. So a lot of your book, just to, to turn to how we got here, um, covers the recent history and actually even further back than that of the Democratic Party, showing the patterns here and showing how they've been they've presented themselves as one party, but they've been something else basically the entire time, you know, and I think that a lot of this history is really what's valuable about your book and what a lot of people wouldn't have known before. For example, I was really fascinated, particularly by the section on Jimmy Carter, because he's presented as such a saint these days. And yet he did have a very checkered history in, in that office. And he was the beginning of the right word lurch. Yes, um, Carter is super old and obviously could die and will die soon, but he could die any second. And when he does, just just watch 
how he's lionized as a hero of American liberalism. But that's bullshit. I mean, he absolutely um, was the beginning of the whole um, democratic Southern strategy of having, the, you know, which, of course, uh, Clinton followed of having a Southern governor. Um, I think Obama, even though he's technically of the North, um, but he still, and he's a senator, not a governor, kind of continues in that same sort of D Democratic Leadership Council vein. Um, but yeah, Carter definitely presided. He ran as a moderate, and he won. And he he certainly governed as a uh, as a right wing Democrat. You know, I mean, people you, people forget that he brought back draft registration, that he. Um, started the war uh, that he funded the Mujahideen who ultimately morphed into Al Qaeda in Afghanistan against the Soviets. Um, Afghanistan looks the way it does now because of he listened to Brzezinski. Um, and uh, there were, uh, it's just he, he, the Reagan defense big military b- uh, buildup of the 1980s, we call it the Reagan buildup, but it really began in 1978 with Jim, under Jimmy Carter and just continued under Reagan. Um, so uh, Carter was a hawk, and he, and in fact, his policy with Iran uh, was hawkish enough to really to provoke the hostage crisis. It didn't just befall him. Um, it, it was something that he brought on himself by propping up the Shah and inviting the Shah to come to the United States to seek medical care. Um, so it's, you know, it, we're going to look back and I think any any progressive historian has to look at Jimmy Carter and say, this guy is the beginning of the end of the Democratic Party as a party that represents working class people. In a state of shock after the war, we interrupt our program for a brief message. If you appreciate this podcast, please consider supporting Colibri on Patreon. Just go to patreon.com slash Colibri. That's K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. And now, back to our regularly scheduled... Right, and then just a few years later, we had Jesse Jackson running in sort of a similar role as Sanders was the last two years coming from the progressive left. Jackson was the first candidate I supported. In 1988 was the year I turned 18 and I was able to caucus for Jesse Jackson in Minnesota where I was going to college that year. And I remember looking back at Jesse Jackson's platform a couple years back and being like, wow, this is almost unrecognizable as being a Democratic Party platform at this point. Jesse Jackson's achievement was remarkable. I mean, he called his his foreign and domestic policy agenda was far to the left of anything that even Bernie Sanders could contemplate today. And what and his, and the thing is, he ran twice, 84 and 88. 88 was the bigger run. Uh, yeah, I was 25 in that election and I voted for him, too. And he was, um, you know, it's I think it's like been forgotten to history because the Democratic Party and its media allies have covered it up. But he got a, he won a lot of primaries. He did really well against Dukakis. Um, he absolutely gave the Democratic Party a major run for its money. I think he did better than anyone expected that he could have possibly, including himself. Um, you know, I think it, at, at the after that primary run, you look you have to look back and say, you know, it's like he may not have really necessarily been ahead of his time. He may just not have realized that it really was his time. But then that's all been swept under the rug ever since. And the Democratic Party really didn't want to have anything to do with it. No, and one of the ways in which his platform really stood out, he was actually calling for defense cuts. And I recall that the Democrats used to be the party that would call for defense cuts, but I believe that stopped, I guess that stopped with Clinton. Yeah, it did. And um, Clinton definitely helped move the needle to the right. I mean, look, we're talking about a party that has not proposed defense cuts uh, really in many decades. It also hasn't proposed an anti-poverty program since the 1960s, um, literally. Uh, and, not, and, and, you know, I use the word proposed very carefully. In other words, we don't even, it's not like Obama or Clinton ever 
you know, put forward a bill and then the Republicans, the big bad Republicans killed it. No, they never even asked for it. It, it obviously, clearly was never a concern of the Democratic Party or the White House um, at all. They didn't care. And uh, they didn't even want to get themselves on the put themselves on the record as saying this is something that ought to be something that we care about in this country. Right. So at this point, it's basically just a hollow reputation that the Democrats are kind of just coasting on. I believe so. Yes. It reminds me a lot of how, you know, it's it, it, how American people come from all over the world. Immigrants come from all over the world to the United States, to uh, a country that they think the streets are paved with gold. And I'm always like, well, you guys, you know, we're just coasting on our old rep, but it ain't true. We're, you know, this, this country is just not that great. And, um, and when you come here as an immigrant, it's not much fun. And so the Democratic Party is very similar, right? It's just like they're still coasting on the reputation uh, created by uh, FDR and to a lesser extent, I would say, um, LBJ. And, uh, and that's pretty much it. And that's, LBJ was the last president who really made fighting poverty and income inequality any kind of priority. Right. And so now we're in this place where where is a progressive supposed to go? And maybe there just isn't any place for a progressive to go within the electoral arena. Um, yeah, I, I think that's true. I don't think there's, there's any place for a leftist um, to go. I mean, I, obviously, look, there's there's the Green Party and people can say that's not viable. Um, well, it's not viable because people don't vote because people choose to not vote for it. I mean, obviously, both major parties at one time were minor parties and they and then people donated money to them and uh, voted for them and they became bigger. And so, like, at some point, people had to be willing to, quote unquote, waste their votes <laughs> in order to uh, in order to change the existing dynamic in like say 1832 or 1856 or 1860 and the same the same thing is true now it's like if you want like say a, a party like the uh like the greens or or a new party let's say a new i mean i've been advocating for a new progressive party um but if you want that to happen you're going to have to vote for them and create it uh, and you're going to have to be willing to quote unquote waste your vote uh but i think the truth is that um, the the system is set up to keep the third to keep third parties uh, from having ballot access. Uh, they they the the, the, the die is cast. The game is fixed. They really it's very very difficult uh, to get any traction because the duopoly uh, really controls everything, and um, they're not going to like they the one thing they can agree on. Well, they can agree on lots of things, unfortunately. Um, is but one of the things they agree on is that they don't want any third party to gain any traction. Yeah, they work very hard on that at the state level. And also the fact that the debates were taken over by the two parties, that made yes. a huge difference too. Yeah, that's something that like went almost unnoticed. It used to be, for those of us uh, like you and me who are old enough to remember, presidential debates were all um, sponsored by the League of Women Voters. And now, of course, uh, there's it's called like the Commission on Presidential Elections or something like that. Right. And it's and that thing is run by the two major parties. And so, you know, that's it's not a coincidence that the last time that there was a third party candidate like, say, um, uh, John Anderson in 1980 or Ross Perot in 1992, it was uh, under the auspices of the League of Women Voters. But that the you know, ever since the two parties have run it. They've managed to keep people like Ralph Nader um, out, off the debate stage, which is, does, I think, a tremendous disservice to democracy. I mean, we need as many choices as possible. I would say it shouldn't just be, for example, a major third party candidate like Ralph Nader. But, you know, hey, if the social I'd like to hear from the socialist workers, you know, I mean, let's you know, when you uh, in other countries, they have a lot of. Um, there's uh, the other the smaller parties are taken a lot more seriously by the media and are given more of a voice. And so, quote unquote, fringe or let's just say smaller um, constituencies 
have a voice in the system. And that's part of the reason, in my view, it's the main reason why voter turnout in other countries is so much higher. I mean, if you look at like European parliamentary style parliamentary democracies like France, the, un- the uh, turnout in a major election is typically around 90 percent or more. Um, and in, the, in this country, it's a major, major victory if 60 percent of the voters turn out for an election. And if you look at the countries that have the lowest voter turnout uh, among the par- electoral democracies, um, you know, like Japan, Australia, uh, and England are countries that have relatively low turnout. It's these; are, they all have one thing in common, which is their two-party systems. So, one one solution that people have put forward for that, and which is now being implemented at local level, is ranked choice voting. I, I spoke earlier this year with Lisa Savage, who's running for Senate as an independent in the state of Maine. And that's one reason why they feel like she has a chance there. Right. Well, I think, you know, there's definitely a lot to be said for ranked choice voting, but you can also see, like, it can also lead to some absurdities too. Um, Like California effectively has that. And, um, and like, you know, you can, you can end up in a, in a situation where like, for example, I mean, maybe you and I don't care, but it is kind of absurd that in California, uh, with ranked choice voting, you can have in the fi- in the general election, you can end up with two Democrats running against each other. So literally, I mean, the Republican Party is still a major force in the state of California. If you're a Republican, you literally don't have a candidate in the general election. That's weird. Yeah, I believe they call that jungle primaries, right? And Yeah, exactly. Right, and that's the reason that Nancy Pelosi has such an interesting challenger this year because uh, have, you, have you seen that it's um Shahed Buttar is his name who's running against her and his yep. yeah, his platform is at least as left as as Bernie's, but I believe well, it's 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 further left than that. And that's why he's able to run against her and not have it be a spoiler thing. Yeah. And it, I mean, look, that's, that's, look, that'd be awesome if he won. Right. But I mean, it would be, but the thing is it's, but again, I still kind of have, I don't think it's like a panacea. I think a part, I think an American, I mean, I think a Europe, uh, European style parliamentary democracy, though not perfect, but I think multiple parties like, you know, like, like in France, Italy, you know, 25 parties, you know, it's, it's a better system than what we have. Right. So really, when it comes down to it, we would come back around to the Howard Zinn quote again, the one where he talks about how it's not important who's sitting in office, but who's sitting in the streets and sitting in the lunchrooms and all of that. Yeah, that's right. I mean, you know, there's this uh, famous uh, poster from the May 1968 uprising in Paris uh, of a woman throwing a brick uh, at the at the viewer. And it says beauty is in the streets. And what it means is like good, you know, real politics is out is in the street. It's protesting. And look, we see that right now with Black Lives Matter. I mean, we until the pandemic protesting was something that people did, especially white people did like on weekends as like a getaway to Washington or to their state capital. Right. And, uh, and you went and you walked around and you chanted and you felt good about yourself. And then you went home and you worked, got ready for the work week. And the, and now with, uh, you know, one out of four voters, uh, unemployed because of the pandemic sitting at home, nothing to do, no distractions, no sports, you know, no, you, you know, no, really there's nothing to do but protest or stay at home. Um, even the restaurants are closed. Uh, suddenly we're in an era of permanent protest and that, and, and the power of that is just amazing. I mean, it's, we have a long, long way to go, but look, I thought we were never going to get rid of those stupid Confederate statues or, you know, the stupid Confederate flags. And look, they're all just, you know, suddenly, oh yeah, we don't need those anymore. And the difference is because the pressure is every single day on an ongoing basis, That's all the difference in the world. That's what the 60s were like. We haven't seen that since the 60s, you know, where protest is everywhere. It's not just, you know, a big, like, big splash in Washington, you know, on May Day, and then we all go home. It's every single day, and it's in Dayton, Ohio, and it's in Lansing, Michigan, and it's everywhere. Um, It's 
it, it's that's where politics live outside in the streets. It's very exciting. I haven't seen anything like it in my lifetime. Certainly the last time where there seemed to be even the feeling of an uprising was, I would say, the WTO uprising. And then the couple years that followed that of the anti-globalization movement. But this is this is bigger than that. And I don't know if you saw the news that came out of Minneapolis yesterday where the city council really is going to dismantle the police department there and basically start from scratch and create an entirely new agency or set of agencies there. I'm very excited about that. I had been calling for that for years and people were calling me a nut. And now it's like this mainstream idea. Um, but I've always thought that the entire system needed to be, uh, you know, thrown out and started from scratch. And, uh, you know, we'll see what, how corrupted it gets. I'm sure it will get corrupted um, because the system is corrupt, but it will. But it's still the fact that um, that they felt compelled to respond with this level of reform shows that they're, you know, for the first time in decades, you know, the powers that be, the political class is forced to take us seriously. Yeah, and I lived in that city for a few years in the 90s, and there really is something there. The American Indian movement was really strong there at one time, for example. And even when I was there in the 90s, there was someone from the Green Party who was sitting on the city council. That's awesome. Yeah. So I think they really do have a shot at it there if, if it's going to happen anywhere. Yeah. No question. Yeah. yeah. One more question, and this actually then relates as well to the next project you've got coming out with Greg Palace, which is that one thing you didn't mention in the book, but that's sort of lurking in the background here is the vast voter disenfranchisement that's been going on as well. Yes. So the, the new book with Greg, Greg's book is um, called How Trump Stole 2000. And uh, so I'm going to be um, and I have a, a comic insert in that uh, 48 page of, of comic book that sort of explains voter suppression techniques in a way that uh, you'll, will make it easy for you to explain to your friends. And um, and basically, uh, it's about the tactics that mainly the Republicans use. Um, Democrats also use voter suppression, but mainly against their own voters during the primaries, as we saw in the last few cycles. Um, and as my book describes, um, but this is this is a Greg's book is more focused on the general election, and uh, it it just talks about techniques like caging and purging uh, that you may have heard of, but it explains how they do it and how pernicious it is. Yeah, because that's a whole other battle to fight there to actually have elections that really are free and and fair where. It means something to be talking about who you want to vote for because it means that you can actually go out and vote and have that vote counted. Exactly. I mean, yeah, it's, it's like, what's the point? And the thing is, the level of, you know, I think like most people, I don't know, maybe I'm naive, but I always thought that there was probably about, uh, you know, a, a fraction of 1% of votes in any given election were lost due to shrinkage, you know, maybe corruption or. Uh, the, the the voter didn't do it right or whatever. Uh, and, and, you know, so like in a very tight race, like, you know, it's down to 0.1%, uh, then like, yeah, that could have an effect on the outcome. But really, it wasn't a broad scale thing. That's not true at all. I mean, you know, uh, Greg really shows that millions of votes in every cycle are deliberately not counted, that are perfectly legitimate. And so we're talking about like a lot of elections are affected. A lot of people uh, are sitting in elected offices that they did not win. Yeah. Stacey Abrams lost was, I think, the most famous one. But there's been many, many examples. And some people, of course, would say that that's why Trump is in at all. Yeah, I think um, I think certainly uh, Republicans benefited for, from voter suppression in uh, 2016. They usually do. I mean, they are a, they're a minority party. Um, and they're and it, it becoming more so all the time. So in order to stay viable, they kind of have to cheat. Um, otherwise, it will soon become a one party country um, in most of the country, especially in the north and in the co on the coasts. But it's definitely a uh, you know, I, I don't think it's the only reason <laughs> Trump won. I mean, I think I think there was more to it. And, and the Democratic Party has really never really faced up to what Trumpism rec uh, represents, which, you know, for example, Donald Trump is still running to the left of Joe Biden on foreign policy. 
and uh, in issues like Russia and Venezuela. Yeah, the latest on Venezuela with, with what Biden had to say was just reprehensible. But So I really appreciate you spending some time with me talking about your new book, and maybe you could tell us where we could find it. Yeah, sure. Well, um, so you can find it, uh, I guess at this point, anywhere where books are sold, which these days is mostly online, depending on what state you're in and what stage we are in the uh, of lockdown or, or lack of lockdown. But um, you can go to you can go to my website, rawl.com, and there's a link that will send you to various uh, independent sites where you can buy the book. Um, you know, obviously, you can get it at Amazon or uh, uh, Powell's, or uh, I recommend ordering it from through your local bookstore. Most local bookstores have a, a pickup on the street, and they'll order the book for you, and then yeah, you can they'll call you, and, and you can go buy and pick it up. That's probably the best way. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Ted. I really appreciate it. And uh, maybe we can talk again some other time. Anytime. Thanks so much for having me. It was fun. Uh -huh. Thank you. Um, Voices for Nature and Peace is produced in the Gila River Valley, New Mexico, USA, on land that we acknowledge is illegally occupied Apache territory. The intro music is Zero G Yogi by Big Z, with narration by Kelly Moody of the Ground Shots podcast. This outro music is Trip A, also by Big Z. Commercial break narration by Nikki Hill. To become a financial supporter of this podcast, and to gain access to members-only content, visit patreon.com slash colibri. K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. -L -L For more information on Radio Free Sunroot programming, please visit RadioFreeSunroot.com. Thank you for listening. May you find joy in your own nature and peace.